Hi, DPTV viewers. Today we are at uh, University of Texas, Dell Medical School in Austin. So the reason we are here is we are going to meet two great personalities and uh, we are going to talk about many facts about facts. So about this statement will come again. Before that, let me introduce our uh, special personalities here. Dr. Tom Brenner, he is a professor of pediatrics and human nutrition and of chemistry in Dell Medical School, University of Texas at Austin. And also, he is a member of 2015 U.S. Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. And his colleague, Dr. Kumar Kothapalli, Associate Professor of Pediatrics, specialized in medical genetics in Dell Medical School, University of Texas at Austin. So let's welcome them to our show. Hi, Dr. Brenner. How are you? I'm just fine, and thank you very much, and welcome to Dell Medical School. Thank you. Hi, Kumar Garu. How are you? I'm good, Srinivas Garu. Thanks so much for coming to Dell Medical School and uh, uh, taking an interview with uh, Dr. Brenna and myself. And, uh, you know, we thank uh, Desi Plaza. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, actually, like, uh, I'm very much excited about this interview because every day, whenever we go to any food item, okay, uh, we, we go to any supermarket or everywhere, if we buy any food item, the first most thing, especially me, I look at is the nutrition facts. So what are these nutrition facts? I mean, they mention so many things about the fat percentage, cholesterol percentage, omega, blah, blah, blah. So many things are there. I mean, why I'm saying blah, blah is I'm not from this background. <laughs> Sorry about that. But first, I mean, when I was talking to Dr. Kumar, and then now uh, he told me like uh, if you want to answers for all of them then this is the right place you have to meet dr uh, tom brenner and um, many other people here so to talk about fats so luckily i got this opportunity so the first most question i have is in general the perception in uh, dietary fats are considered bad for human health especially increasing heart diseases risk so my question is is really fat is that much bad or it is a good well <laughs> thanks for that uh, that question so i can clarify a little bit about the story of good fat bad fat we we think about fat in our diet uh, as being good or bad and it, it certainly is not bad as a uh, overall uh, sort of substance in the in the diet. Um, uh, it is more a question of uh, the quality of fat compared to the amount of fat. So in the 1990s, uh, we had a period where we uh, advised people to lower their fat consumption and increase their carbohydrate consumption and that turned out not to be such great advice and I don't think we had the basis for those uh, uh, for that advice um, and and uh, we we, we uh, move past that to really emphasize more the quality of the fat rather than the amount of the fat and it's become very clear um, that it is quality rather than amount that is important so I mean to say we should have the fat, but the quality of the fat should be good, and uh, uh, instead of saying the quantity of the fat. Right? Yes, that's that's right. And there has, uh, for uh, well over a hundred years in the United States, has been something of a battle. Uh, between various suppliers of fat, that is the food companies uh, that supply us with fat. And, and, and so these uh, would largely be between, let's say, uh, milk fat and other animal fats, pork fat, beef fat, et cetera, um, and uh, vegetable fats. 
and it's sort of gone uh, between these two giant sort of industries. Uh, and, um, uh, and uh, of course, the, the uh, medical profession has been deeply into this, uh, this story and um, uh, has tried to make it a little bit easier by talking about whether a fat is liquid or solid. But there's been intense study over uh, uh, the past 60 or 70 years, really since the 1950s, on the effects um, as much on heart disease as any other, but I, I will also uh, discuss with you that, that fat is critically important for the development of the, of the eyes and of the brain. That's the part we study the most here in our, in our laboratory. Um, and the fats that support that development in uh, pregnant moms, in nursing moms, in babies, in kids, some what we call maternal and child nutrition, are right at the top, the most important stuff. And heart disease will take care of itself um, if we get that right. So those are the things that, that, that we're particularly um, interested in our lab and that I will uh, try to explain a little bit in this, uh, in this discussion. Very good. So thank you. Thanks for that clarification. And uh, the other one is like, what is your take on standard fats and cholesterol story? So cholesterol story, so you are actually, why I'm asking this question is, you are part of US Dietary Guidelines Committee, which states that the dietary cholesterol is no longer a concern. So in that case, do you recommend eating eggs and shrimp so all these things more or I mean what is your state uh, or comment on cholesterol okay so cholesterol is uh, required for the function of every cell in our body so it is not some kind of foreign substance our body makes a great deal of cholesterol every day constantly um, and then we eat cholesterol so both sources. Um, we also use cholesterol for digesting fats, um, so it, it's very important stuff. And um, uh, the the uh, connection to the, the dietary guidelines and uh, the uh, nutrient of concern status, um, in part, was a technical definition. Um, but w without getting into those technicalities. Um, uh, we began to realize that our concern about the link between dietary cholesterol, that is the cholesterol we eat in our food, and the cholesterol level in our blood uh, is not as strong as we uh, assumed it was 50 years ago. And uh, so uh, what, we, what we did in uh, a few decades ago was to tell people don't eat eggs because they have they have high cholesterol. In fact, I, 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 I um, have been around the field a long time, and um, uh, a mentor of mine uh, uh, once suggested in the 1970s that we ought to warn people about eggs because they have cholesterol almost the way you would warn people about smoking and, to and tobacco and nicotine and all. Well, that that's just, it just goes way too far. I think we all agree about that right now. And so um, we, we um, uh, in the dietary guidelines, uh, said that cholesterol, the link between dietary cholesterol and blood cholesterol is actually much weaker than, we, than, than, uh, than was believed, and that it is okay to eat an egg or two uh, or uh, a day. Um, at the previous guidelines really would uh, limit you to the cholesterol in one egg a day. Um, but uh, I think we've come to understand that the nutrition of um, uh, the, the nutrient profile, the nutrient richness in, in, in an egg, um, it goes way beyond cholesterol and that we shouldn't be discouraging people. Now, that also leads me to the, to the notion, and you'll hear it over and over and over again as we talk, of balance. All right? Balance. We don't want to say, eat no fat, eat no carbohydrate, eat no protein, and that's the way it seems to go. Uh, we don't want to say, eat no eggs. We don't want to eat, say, eat a dozen eggs for breakfast. 
we, we think that a balance is what we ought to have, right? So we're not taking a lid off and saying, you know, eat, eat anything you want. We're saying eat in moderation, which, of course, is what most of our moms said. That is good. So we have to make the balance. That is a really good suggestion, and everybody is saying that. But how do we balance that? Like how, in the sense, what is the quantity you suggest per day, how many eggs we can eat or even uh, people have the perception like uh, shrimp or uh, prawns, they have a lot of cholesterol. So if at all we choose to eat that, so how much of the quantity per day we can take? Yeah, so I like to answer questions like that in terms of a longer period than a day. Um, I don't think you're going to die if you eat six eggs in one day, but I think if you eat six days, six eggs every day, that probably wouldn't be so good. And so if we said, look, limit it to an average, uh, let's say over a week of um, 10 or 14 eggs, and this is for an average person, it's not for people who have uh, various kinds of genetic uh, abnormalities or uh, unusual genetics different than the, than the population, but for average person who has normal metabolism, um, uh, something like 10 or even uh, 10 or 15 eggs a week should be okay. Thank you. And uh, even I have so many questions for you because especially when it is coming to the nutrition and fats, all those things, I have listed down many, so I am keep going. So the other one is like large number of South Asians, especially Indians, like deep fried food items. So nowadays, um, sunflower oil is widely popular in India as, uh, I mean, it is like a heart friendly oil. So do you recommend sunflower oil for deep frying? Also, please tell us like, uh, is that sunflower oil is good for uh, uh, cooking and uh, deep fried, all those things. So I have to get a little bit complicated in the way I answer this, um, but, uh, but it's really important for your viewers to understand a couple of points about uh, the way we now have to think about oils. Once upon, once upon a time, for most of my lifetime, for most of your lifetime, the, the name of a plant, like sunflower, would define the nutritional profile of that uh, of the oil that might that would come from it but because of selective breeding and not just genetically modified organisms but just the kind of breeding that our ancestors have been doing for hundreds of years we now have products that have very different nutrient profiles that go under the same name sunflower oil so um, about 15 years ago in the United States, um, sunflower oil uh, had a very high amount of what we call omega-6 fatty acid. We call it omega-6 linoleic acid, 6. Predominant huge amount of this oil, of uh, this uh, fat, and a very tiny amount of, uh, in, in fact, almost none of uh, omega-3. And we know that that particular oil, if we feed it to a uh, pregnant animal, causes abnormalities in the offspring, mental abnormalities. doesn't do anything to the heart. They, they grow just fine, but when we test them later on, there's abnormalities. In, um, in the last 15 years, and, and it's, it's over a... a it's, it's probably five or ten years now that that has been the case. We have another product, uh, and in the U.S., this product is also sunflower oil. Almost all the sunflower oil, nearly 100%, is now uh, low omega-6, or what we call high oleic. And you can buy high oleic in the stores. And that high oleic sunflower oil has a composition very similar to olive oil. So what I like to tell people is that we have taught sunflowers how to make olive oil. It's not 100% true, but it's, it's partially true. That oil has much better effects on the omega-3s because it does not suppress them. This is another balance issue when omega-6 is very high 
omega-3 is very low. We create a demand for this because there is a competition, an antagonism between these two. We want them to be more balanced. If they are balanced, because we're using modest uh, oils with modest amounts of omega-6, that effectively is what we're doing, then um, uh, we need actually less omega-3 to get the same effect. Okay, so that's a complicated part. So now I'm going to come to your to the answer to your question, um, which is should we should we use sunflower oil? Well, in the United States, our sunflower oil, as I said, looks a lot like olive oil. In the U.S., you'll recognize that everybody loves olive oil in the sort of uh, sort of American European kind of context. Everyone loves those, uh, loves olive oil, and so it looks a lot like sunflower oil. The rest of the world has not done this yet, so uh, I'm very concerned that in the service of heart health, that is lowering cholesterol, we're going to ignore the important, the more important thing in my view, which is the development of the, the brain and the eyes in babies um, by using very large amounts of sunflower oil. And those data are very clear in animals. I think they're so clear that you wouldn't even do a human study, you wouldn't allow a human study because those data are so clear. So I think we've got to be very careful in the Indian context to be sure that we don't overload on sunflower oil, um, and particularly that we're, we're uh, uh, limiting the amount that, uh, that goes to uh, the pregnant moms and lactating moms, moms that are nursing, nursing kids who have their, whose brains are developing. Your brain develops, uh, kids' brains develop until age 18. Moms uh, uh, have uh, 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 enhanced demand for omega-3s, and it's the omega-3s that support the brain. Your brain is full of omega-3s. It's like a big fish oil uh, 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 organ, and so are the eyes. And uh, these, these, these oil questions are important for, uh, for the, the, the brain and, and the eyes. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Brenna. Thank you so much, Brenna, for answering that question. So the other one is like uh, whenever we see any oils nowadays, we see mainly like uh, two types. One is refined oil, the other one is non-refined oil. So what is your comment on it? Refined oils uh, and refining is necessary for many of the sort of oils that we use. However, um, uh, ref the refining process can introduce what we call process contaminants. And those process contaminants can have important effects, and that's been long recognized. If we use unrefined oils, and again, I'll answer in the, in the American context, and in the European context, we think about olive oil and we talk about extra virgin olive oil, virgin olive oil. Um, another thing that's become very popular in the United States is virgin coconut oil. And I think virgin coconut oil may be more relevant for the Indian context because it is made from the fresh coconut, the sort of thing where you take a coconut off the tree and you scoop out the white, and then mom just kind of puts it in the blender and skims off some of the fat. That's more like what it is, rather than in the refining methods which dry the coconut and extract them with uh, organic solvents um, that are not terribly unlike gasoline and um, and then uh, not gasoline but they're, they're sort of a cousin of that and, um, and and then they have to be processed in various ways now that processing um, for some oils is important it has to happen we wouldn't be able to use them if we didn't but the harshness with which we treat those oils can create uh, what I, process contaminants. That is, it can create molecules that are not healthy in the oil. It can also remove molecules that are healthy in the oil. So um, I uh, like to, th to think about an unrefined oil, or what we call a virgin oil, as, the, um, it, it, as where we start and that any, any processing will be uh, as mild as possible. Now, you can't really tell about that. If you're a consumer, you go into the store and you say what's refined and what isn't refined. And some refining is actually important. You can't really make a, an oil that will do deep frying unless you do some refining. Um, my appeal more on this is less to consumers and more to industry to be very careful to think about creating oils that you would want to feed your kids and your grandkids, and your mom. Um, and um, from, uh, from my part, I try to 
use mostly unrefined oils, mostly virgin oils, virgin olive oil, a little bit of virgin um, uh, uh, coconut oil, though I, I just I don't use um, but, but but not because I've got a nutritional problem with it. Um, and, um, and, and, and oils like, uh, like butter and ghee um, are really not very refined also, and um, I, I think are um, also quite good. These traditional fats that, that, uh, that have been used in, in virtually every culture. Actually, when you are talking about um, uh, ghee, then immediately one more question clicked in my mind. So in uh, olden days, especially when I was a kid, so we used it to have a lot of ghee. In almost all in every food item we use it to eat mm -hmm. ghee. But nowadays due to these fats and uh, other, uh, uh, I mean uh, cholesterol or something, whatever the people are fearing about. So most of the people stopped eating ghee. So is it really good sign or bad sign? So what do you comment about the uses of ghee? I, I think that uh, the, the composition of ghee is more consistent with what I see in the biochemistry and the genes. Um, it was something that we've been subsisting on as humans in every culture for uh, thousands of years. And a uh, shift away from that because we're only looking at one thing cholesterol levels and whether a little higher or a little lower seems to me to be uh, uh, not a good idea that we are taking those numbers way too far um, and um, and I think that it, 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 it's part of the um, uh, part of the, the the story in the states that we moved very much to these vegetable oils that, that are very high in omega-6 ghee is low in omega-6. Milk fats, milk fat, butter, ghee, are low in omega-6. And um, I, I, I was just the other day at an Indian restaurant uh, in Austin, and I had a, a, a sog. And uh, it was, uh, 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 so these nice, uh, these nice green leaves, and um, I, I uh, uh, assume that was cream in there, or sort of this animal fat, same stuff. And um, that actually is quite a good mixture of fat for omega-3s. It turns on omega-3. If that was made with uh, old sunflower oil in the U.S. or what I guess is a lot of the commodity, regular sunflower oil in, 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 in India, it would really suppress the omega-3. So, uh, so I'm a fan of, uh, of ghee, and I don't think a case has been made uh, to do a wholesale uh, substitution. Traditional foods uh, are good. Okay. So that is an important point. The traditional foods are always good. Yeah, Dr. Brenna, one more question about uh, omega-3. So high intake of omega-3 will lead to prostate cancer, it seems. So like, is it uh, really true or that's an easy one, no. Uh, uh, the, the story of omega-3 and prostate cancer is traceable to one single paper that was uh, widely reported in the press, in part because, I'm told, of uh, a, a very uh, active, and I would say overactive, um, public relations department in the university. The study uh, was uh, that the study uh, evaluated prostate cancer in another study that had nothing whatsoever to do with omega threes. It was a study of selenium and vitamin E study, and I knew about that other study from years earlier. I I was not involved in developing it, but a f good friend of mine was, and. What those folks did was take the data on prostate cancer in uh, that study, and they looked at the fatty acids in those who did not have prostate cancer and those who did have prostate cancer, and they found that there is a slight difference in the two. It was statistically significant. And the next thing they said was, right, so 
you could have that tiny difference in omega-3s if you took omega-3 pills. Therefore, you should be careful about taking omega-3 pills. Well, that is going, uh, I almost can't say, not just leaping across the uh, with a teeniest amount of data, but just saying something that doesn't make any sense with respect to the context of the study and the context of omega-3s in general. So to just give you an idea about this, um, the level of uh, omega-3 in the folks that uh, had cancer is something like a third of the level of omega-3 in Japanese men. Japanese do not have huge amounts of prostate cancer. You would expect that if omega-3s cause prostate cancer, the Japanese would be all be dying of prostate cancer when they're 30 years old. So the, the idea that, uh, they, that, that uh, this tiny, trivial amount, and, and, and for those of you who think about numbers, it was less than a 5% difference between these two, um, could possibly contribute to, uh, to prostate cancer was just unsupported. And uh, myself and a few others had written a letter to the Journal of the National Cancer Institute where the original paper was published in order to point these facts out. There is nothing to any of that. It, none of that has ever played out. I have even heard that the first author on that paper took it back. So we really have to bury that idea. It's not right, period, full stop, end of story, go eat some salmon. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you so much for the detailed clarification. And um, actually, before I conclude my questions, so I would like to know a few more details about your research uh, uh, on the facts, like how long you have been doing this research and <laughs> like, uh, oh, I mean, uh, what are all the places you have already presented? I heard that uh, you visited a couple of other countries and uh, you conducted some awareness sessions about these fats and uh, other things. So could you please tell us about it? Oh boy, I, I had the wonderful um, uh, g good fortune to uh, walk into a laboratory that studies fats when I was a teenager. I was, uh, I think I was just still 18 years old, and I walked into the laboratory of, uh, I'll say his name, uh, Dr. Bob Jensen at the uh, University of Connecticut, and uh, uh, I was looking for a job, and I was a nutrition major, and I didn't know what a lipid was. Lipids are fats. That's a technical name for a fats. And um, uh, uh, I started studying uh, them in that laboratory. Um, I went through my graduate work, and I did things in chemistry and other, other areas. Uh, didn't always work in the, in the medical area, but then since, uh, uh, since the late 1980s have been working in the area of fats and oils and nutrition and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it's almost 30 years uh, that I've been in the research area, but still this was something that I was kind of uh, introduced to when I was a teenager. So that's, that's a little weird, but there it is. Um, I've, I've uh, uh, had the good fortune to have um, uh, spoken about fats uh, all over the world. I uh, uh, this year have been to China, to Australia a couple times, to uh, uh, Malaysia, to, uh, uh, to Singapore. Uh, uh, I, I've spoken um, in Europe, in South Africa, um, and, and around the world. The um, uh, thing I'm most excited about now is a uh, symposium that we are going to have uh, in uh, Hyderabad uh, in uh, September uh, that will be all about uh, fats and oils in maternal and child nutrition uh, in the Indian context. Actually, it, it's really maternal and child nutrition. There'll be people who specialize in fats, so it'll be other things too, uh, but it'll be in the Indian context. And I'm, I'm just, just so excited about doing this. We've, uh, 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 Dr. Kothapali and I have spent um, uh, a heck of a lot of time this year in uh, pulling this thing together, and I've only been to India once, uh, 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 and this will be my second, second visit, and we're really excited to uh, 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 to now meet some of our uh, Indian colleagues that we've met around the world, but now in their, on their home turf 
and to uh, and, and, and to, for me to get a much better understanding of um, of that Indian context um, uh, and uh, uh, and to uh, uh, possibly uh, uh, get some um, uh, some research going perhaps and also to uh, to contribute if we can uh, to, uh, to to health in India. Thank you. Thank you so much. And also, we are more excited to see you in uh, India. So, and also give more knowledge about these fats. And you said that you are going to give the uh, seminars or uh, some awareness sessions, especially for maternal uh, kids, right? I mean, uh, what do you say? Like, uh, f uh, f for me, moms and babies are are the tops. We should we we got we we should start by getting moms and babies right, not fifty year old men like us. Well, anyway, me. Uh, <laughs> we've got to get moms and babies right. That's where we should be focusing our attention. Moms and babies, development of the brain, development of vision, uh, uh, maintenance of good mood, preventing depression, keeping people happy. That is a paramount, I think, among all goals. Sure. Thank you so much, Brian. So, yeah, uh, Brenna, sorry. So, like, um, I got so much of information from you and also, like, um, now so many questions got clarified when I was talking to you. So, it's really very happy and uh, I'm, I felt very glad to meet you here and get all these questions answered. Thanks a lot. Th thanks so much for coming coming to visit us. Yeah, Dr. Brenna. So the one more question is like, so lot of Indians eat ghee. So is that ghee good or bad? Good. And why do I say that? It, traditional foods are foods like like ghee that uh, our uh, ancestors lived on and that our genes are tuned to. And we know from basic biochemistry, from understanding of our genetics, and from other kinds of scientific studies, that the fat composition in uh, ghee and in milk fat in general is healthy for us for supporting, uh, uh, our, the, particularly the uh, uh, even though it has very low omega-3, it also has low omega-6, and it's good for developing uh, for moms and babies. So the other one is uh, like sunflower oil. So this sunflower oil in India we use in many forms. So do you recommend to use this sunflower oil for cooking and then the deep fries? The, the commodity sunflower oil that was used in the that, that was used in the United States has tr all transitioned over to an oil that looks more like ghee or looks more like olive oil, and that's what I recommend. What is used in India, I don't exactly know. I think it is the older one, and what I would recommend to the Indian uh, government, to the Indian uh, industry, is to transition over the same way the United States did uh, to these high oleic sunflower oils that are healthier for uh, frying and for, uh, uh, for cooking and for all, all sorts of uh, uh, uses. Okay. So the other one uh, in our discussions, we heard like um, there is more percentage of depression depressions reported uh, nowadays in India. So I mean, uh, what do you comment on it, and uh, what would be the best remedy for that? From the fat point of view, um, we have come to understand and that the kind of fats that are found in fish, that is, uh, the omega-3 long-chain fatty acids, we use uh, letters EPA, um, we find that those are uh, good for uh, reducing symptoms of depression, which is another way of saying that they seem to be deficient. So it's the omega-3 fats that are particularly important from the context of depression, and that always means raise some omega-3 and lower omega-6. Okay, that's good. And the uh, other one, uh, like this September, you have India visit. So, like, what is the main uh, uh, contest, I mean, uh, context about that uh, India trip? 
We have organized a capstone event in collaboration with the uh, National Institute of Nutrition in Hyderabad uh, with uh, uh, some of the uh, leaders in the research uh, into uh, maternal and child nutrition, and we will talk about uh, maternal and child nutrition in the Indian context with our collaborators and our colleagues in India. About half uh, will be uh, half of the speakers will be from outside India and half inside India. And I'm very excited to uh, to visit in uh, in a few weeks. Sure. Thank you so much. All the best for your India visit.